welcome everybody uh, to this um, first event of October uh, of the Management and Social Justice Conversation Series. Um, and our coordinator who reminds us that she will be recording this event uh, because it's recorded video, video, video recorded and shared it with all those who RSVP as well as um, upload it on uh, kind of my private channel on the YouTube. So it's available for anybody that wants to use for teaching and uh, collaboration purposes. And uh, so this particular topic is uh, personally very close to my heart uh, because I'm also a health tech entrepreneur myself and uh, my company was the first to develop a, a non-Caucasian based uh, neuroassessment uh, commercial product in the world. And I'm really uh, you know, committed to uh, access and affordability of healthcare and that we should be able to open it up for everybody. And uh, so this particular panel is like truly close to my heart. And it's also truly close to my heart because all these people that uh, are on the panel, uh, some of them I know personally, uh, have very long relationship, uh, like with Tim. Uh, we go a long way back and uh, with the, the panel moderator Meha, who actually I think I knew her from when she was in high school. <laughs> so, so this is uh, extremely exciting to have everybody around and have this conversation about how we bring access and inclusion and diversity and justice uh, to healthcare system. And one of my strong beliefs is that uh, especially in healthcare system, it's really important to look at it from an ecosystem perspective, not just from an individual organization or a particular delivery model, but from an ecosystem perspective. So I'm really excited that we have several representatives from uh, the healthcare ecosystems today in the panel. And, uh, and Meha, uh, Meha Chiraya is uh, the Director of Inclusion, Equity and Belonging at Amgen. Uh, but she's uh, for the commercial operations, but she's also served in Amgen in other uh, sales and marketing and operations roles before which she was in Accenture as a consultant for several years, focusing on healthcare uh, as an industry. And uh, on, uh, uh, on a, as a hobby, Mega is also a podcaster and she uh, runs a podcast focusing on women uh, and how they define success and different women. So, you know, hit her up and follow her on our LinkedIn. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, this conversation and how Meha's perspective and where she's going to wear two hats since she comes from the health techs, uh, healthcare sector and especially pharma and as a consultant from the industry, uh, as well as uh, she's going to be moderating the panel. And so I'm really excited. So welcome everybody, thank you. And please use the Q&A feature for posting questions and uh, use the chat for having conversations. And we have an amazing panel today, I'm excited. And I also wanna wish one of our panelists, Kim Custer from Planned Parenthood, a very happy birthday. Uh, Kim is, uh, Kim's birthday today, I didn't know that when I scheduled it, but uh, you know, we are happy to have her, although we are making a work on her birthday. So uh, thanks everybody and over to you, Meha. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, the warm wishes to Kim for her birthday. Uh, so, so audience, how we will um, go through the next uh, approximately hour and a half together, uh, we'll start out with introductions, right? You'll hear from each of our panelists, who they are, what is the challenge that they're facing currently from their lens in the healthcare ecosystem to address healthcare inequities. And then from there, we do have a few discussion topics that we're excited to share with all of you from our perspectives where we found that despite being in different parts of the healthcare ecosystem, there are some commonalities that we found with how we're uh, addressing solutions to make a difference. One of those is empowerment. So we'll get to that in a, in a bit. And then finally, we'll ensure that we have a few minutes towards the end to close out with an audience Q&A. And as Latha mentioned, please be sure uh, to use a Q&A box to, to put in your questions. So I'll just start out before handing it over to my, my uh, fellow panelists here. So as Lessa mentioned, uh, my name is Meha Chiraya and currently I serve as Director of Diversity, Inclusion, Belonging at Amgen. Uh, you heard my full bio, so I'll keep it short, but, but really what I want to address is what is one of the big things that we're trying to solve, right? Uh, within the, the corporate space, especially. In general, we are striving to ensure that our workforce is truly inclusive and representative of the communities that we serve. 
right? That's kind of the internal facing view with the workforce. And then externally, we recognize that we have a role to play, especially when it comes to our clinical trials with addressing healthcare inequities by ensuring that we have representation from underserved populations into our clinical trials. So there's a couple of the, the big buckets from my end, but I would love to uh, now hand it over to my panelists to again introduce themselves, their role, and then what challenge you're facing today. Uh, we'll start out with Heather. Great, thanks so much, Meha. Thank you, Lata. Thanks to all of you who are joining today and to our fellow panelists. My name is Heather Anderson and I am the CEO of Global Health Corps. Global Health Corps was founded in 2009 with a mission and vision of mobilizing the next generation of global health equity leaders. For me personally, I actually began my career as a management consultant in the private sector, but I had always had passion for women's rights and gender equality. So in my late 20s, I quit my job, much to probably the chagrin of my parents. I packed up all of my things, put them into a U-Haul truck and moved to Washington, D.C. This is where I ultimately landed and started my new career path um, and started my work at Planned Parenthood Global. And on this new path, I really learned during this time that uh, you know, while my skills and experiences from the private sector were somewhat different and obviously working in sort of a different industry that there were a lot of really important skills that, that could be transferable and used um, into my sort of new career path. And that, um, you know, whether it was through leading projects, managing teams, that, that I really could help contribute and make a difference in the sector. You know, I saw that we couldn't uh, um, tackle complex health challenges if we didn't have people coming from diverse backgrounds and perspectives to be able to make a difference. And so this ultimately led me to Global Health Corps, where I have been since 2012. When I did join uh, nine years ago, we were a small and scrappy organization with a big vision and that today we have recruited and trained a global network of 1100 um, exciting, amazing, talented leaders and growing, We're all working in the global health and social impact space. And you know, overall, the GHC community is incredibly diverse, um, but ultimately are united in two uh, um, guiding beliefs. One, that health is a human right, and two, that leadership is a powerful lever for change in global health. And I can just close uh, you know, my intro to say that this is really um, the challenge that we are tackling, really sort of raising awareness of the role of leadership, that it is critically important to be investing in the who of who should leaders be, who have been the voices that have been underrepresented and how they lead matters. And that's what's gonna chart the future ahead. So thank you again for being here and Meha, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Heather. Yes, I think what you mentioned about leadership, excited to dig into that further with you a bit later uh, as a key part of the role of management addressing health equity. Uh, Tim, over to you. Thank you. And first and foremost, my apologies for my late arrival. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Tim Ewing. I'm the Vice President of People and Organization Development at Mass General uh, Brigham Health Integrated Healthcare System based in Massachusetts. We're the largest um, private employer throughout the state. And I came to this work in healthcare out of um, an inequity. Um, my mom had been diagnosed with lung cancer and I was her primary caretaker. And what I discovered was that there were so many ways in which the providers were missing my mother. And what I mean by that is, um, for example, uh, someone who was half my age came into the room and called my mother by her first name. And I could just see the train wreck starting to happen because I knew that she was not going to pay attention to them. She continued to look out of the window. And, um, and so there was a lot of opportunity for me to work with those providers in terms of, first and foremost, my mom isn't your peer. <laughs> She's a senior African-American woman. And also you need to call her Mrs. Ewing. Um, and there were so many other projections that were placed on her around um, being a, a 70 year old, 70 plus year old woman and her diet and all those things. There were just so many projections. 
And then my career led to an opportunity to work in healthcare. Prior to that, I had been a global diversity and organizational change consultant for about 20 years. And in coming internal to be the leader of, um, I was a chief learning and inclusion officer for an organization. There were so many ways in which patients, although um, were, were integral to the mission, they weren't centered uh, in the mission. And as a part of that, you know, how do we then, and, and this is where my work takes me today, is how can we actually be excellent in our patient care if we don't include equity as our lens for decision-making care and our leadership and, and, and how leaders and clinicians partner with the community, partner with our patients to have the best possible outcomes. So within our organization, we are saying that as a part of your leadership deliverables as a part of your competencies, thinking equitably and acting equitably with our patients and our policies and our practice is central to our mission. So thus and therefore, we measure how leaders are thinking um, and activating um, um, equity. And, and also, I'll just go just one more second to say that, and we, because of the, the climate, the nature, the, the culture of what we're experiencing um, in, in, in the world, race has become central to the work that we're doing um, in, in this space. And, uh, you know, I've certainly been faced with the component of, well, wh why are we just talking about race? Ah, isn't that transferable? <laughs> because if we can talk about the unspeakable that we have not talked about for for many white people, right? They haven't talked about race, they don't understand. And for many people of color, it's been a part of our dinner conversation since we were two, right? So how, if we can build that muscle to be proactive around race, ah, it can be transferable to a global context. Ah, if those power differentials uh, transfer across gender, oh, sexual orientation, oh, the position in the organization, it just becomes so transferable that um, we, we think equitably as a result of having race at the center, and then we can build out from that as well. So thank you, I'm glad to be here. Yes, thank you, Tim. And one of the, the um, pieces that you mentioned around partnership with their communities, I'm excited to dig into that a bit further as we get into uh, the topic sure. discussions. Great, thank yeah. you, Tim. Uh, Dale, over to you. Good day, everyone. Um, and before I get into uh, myself, who am I, what do we do? I'd like to set the stage for a moment. Uh, the diabetes epidemic in America is like a cat four hurricane, but in black America, it's a cat five hurricane as evidenced by mortality rates, uh, kidney disease, retinopathy, leg foot amputations, um, not to mention uh, the role that diabetes played in the COVID pandemic. Um, and yet, for all of the chronic disease innovation, uh, funding, mergers taking place, uh, Black health metrics have not improved year over year. So we created Heiko Health to tackle this problem. We are uh, a bottoms-up, community-driven intervention model focused on type 2 diabetes in underserved Black populations where community healthcare professionals, safety net organizations, integrate our mobile health apps to support their, diab their diabetic patients beyond the 20 minute doctor visit, beyond um, brick and mortar. Our clients are uh, dietitians, primary care doctors, independent pharmacies, uh, community health centers, churches, um, who've come to the place of acknowledgement that no one is coming to save them and they have to use um, any and all resources to care for their communities. Our end user, um, their patients enroll in our virtual classes on our phone, on their phones to uh, participate in a disease class um, that relates to them, pre-diabetes, diabetes, hypertension, um, and obesity. And they learn how to adopt practice and normalize healthy behavior. So that's the space we're in and that's what we try to do. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dale. And I think the piece you mentioned on community-driven interventions, uh, eager to hear more about how you, how you help shape that. Great. Uh, Kim, over to you. 
Thanks, Maya. Uh, my name is Kim Custer. I am the Executive Vice President uh, for Healthcare at Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And um, when I think about the life experiences that have shaped me and brought me to the role that I'm in now, it, it really comes from three different places. Two of them you don't really get from a CV, right? One is just as a young person, I lived overseas in Jakarta, Indonesia at two different times in my lifetime. And they were at points that were very impressionable points in my life. Um, I was young and it, I can vividly remember that it's the first time, just the first, <laughs> where I recognize that not all people face the same challenges. You're, he you're hearing a theme around race and health equity. And, um, and I think when you're in a place like Jakarta, at least for me when I was younger, the, it was glaringly obvious this big divide in, in the haves, the have nots and the positions they are. But, but what I recognize now as an, as an adult is that the financial divide, the healthcare divide, these inequities, they are ever present in the US. This is not a third world problem. This is, this is an every country problem. Um, and it really opened my eyes and it made me question things. It made me learn to not blindly follow, to demand better and more of myself so that I could actually have an impact in the world. Um, this, the other part is just, I'm a mother. And, you know, listen, I learned a lot about how to have empathy and compassion, humility, flexibility, being less judgmental, like all of these values that we all carry. Um, I act, I really believe that Planned Parenthood is the single most humbling experience of my lifetime. Um, and it has helped me actually be a better leader and a better manager inside of the Planned Parenthood movement, which is where I have been working for the last 20 plus years of my life. 12 of them were as a CEO um, in Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, when I was very focused on increasing access to abortion, it was a point when you could only get an abortion if you could drive to, Penn, to Philadelphia or Pittsburgh. And if you live up in the north central part of Pennsylvania, that was just not something someone was going to do. Um, and now uh, in my role as an executive leader um, at the national office, looking at the landscape of the country for the last six years, I really, you know, Meha, you asked us earlier around what's our greatest challenge. And um, well, I mean, there's the obvious, you cannot look at the news right now and see what the challenges are that Planned Parenthood and our patients in particular are facing in real time. But as a leader, you know, my challenge and my opportunity is stepping in and acknowledging how much I don't know and I, and I learn something new every day. Uh, and then making a commitment over and over again to myself to make it a priority to learn on how I can leverage my experiences, my sphere of influence to drive impact in the, in the health equity space. And I take that responsibility really seriously um, as a manager to my team who need me to lead by example to my peers who need me to be unflappable in my resolve to dismantling systems of white supremacy within our organization and within um, the ecosystems that we operate in and to our Planned Parenthood affiliates who rely on me and my role to do all that I can at our national office to create the conditions for them to provide equitable access to healthcare in their local communities for the two and a half million patients who turn to Planned Parenthood each year. I mean, we are a hundred year old organ plus, we're more than a hundred years old um, as an organization, but we are committed to change. I think it's hard to change. The older your organization gets, you fall victim to staying entrenched. We have an amazing new leader at Planned Parenthood Federation America. And um, we're committed to that change, not just for ourselves, but to more effectively partner within the public health system. So, you know, um, it's just really great to be here today and be part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And I think what struck me was your phrase around the sphere of influence, right? And that's, I feel like a, a theme that all of us have within the healthcare ecosystem, our role that, and in the companies that we, that we work for, we've created. Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, anu, over to you. 
Thanks, Neha. Um, this is a really humbling panel to be a part of, and I'm really excited about the discussion to come. Uh, I'm Anu Parvatir. I run a small medical device company called Ananya Health. We are building a portable cryoablation device to treat precancerous lesions in the cervix um, before they become malignant. So before things turn into cervical cancer to eliminate those lesions and uh, act, as, act as a preventative treatment. And this matters because cryoablation has actually been done in the US and, and elsewhere in the world since the 1970s. And yet cervical cancer is still the fourth largest cancer killer of women in the world which is an insane statistic. It's completely detectable early, it's preventable, um, and yet it's still a huge burden. And unfortunately, that burden is, um, it's, it's a question of access. 90% uh, of cases and deaths happen in emerging markets and developing countries. And what we're trying to do is make the, the preventative procedures an order of magnitude cheaper and uh, you know, take away reliance on infrastructure that you currently need to be able to perform these kinds of preventative treatments. So battery powered device, as opposed to plug into the wall, um, no consumable components, you're not relying on an external supply chain. And um, my background, how I got here is I'm an engineer by training, and I've always been fascinated by this question of how do we solve problems in the places that that aren't really focused on design wise. And that is also, you know, to answer your question may have about one of the challenges that we face in our work. Um, you know, medical device is has traditionally been medical device innovation has traditionally been a US focused market you you design your devices on the re US reimbursement strategy, you look at that as your primary market. Uh, it's very, very uncommon to, to design with an outside the US mentality first, and it's very uncommon for investors to fund something like that. And so we're sort of at this interesting intersection of women's health, which is a chronically underfunded segment in medical device and biopharma, and then a, a medical device, which is generally focused on the US, and public health, which generally doesn't look at medical devices in general. So we're, we're at an interesting intersection of trying to address something that we think is a huge problem, that is a huge area of focus for the global community, but yet this isn't one of the traditional approaches that generally, um, generally get looked at in that global health community. But I think that's what also makes it really fun. Um, it's also the, the challenge that I think that, you know, the background that I've had um, allows me to, you know, I started my career in medical device design and I... Similar to Heather's story, I uh, in my in my mid to late twenties, I got a phone call from a friend that was doing public health work in Nigeria, and much to my parents' chagrin, I quit my job as an engineer and moved to West Africa for four years. And I don't think they've ever forgiven me for that decision, but you know, I think it worked out okay. So I think it's worked out great, Anu. <laughs> um, and Anu, I think something that. <clears throat> you spoke on as well as Dale, on how you are using your vision and technology to address healthcare and underserved populations, right? Whether women's health, cervical cancer, diabetes in the black population. Excited to talk more about that uh, in a bit. <clears throat> so thank you panelists for, for sharing kind of what shaped you to who you are today, some of the challenges that you're facing. One of the themes that I mentioned at the start of this conversation was around empowerment, right? And after reflecting a bit more on what you all shared, one way that I personally look at empowerment is ensuring people have a voice when it comes to their own health care. Uh, the, the story, personal story that you shared, Tim, your mother is Mrs. Ewing, right? And, and that's something that would have helped her perhaps in the early stages of her care, uh, if, even if you weren't there, right, to, to be kind of the guide for her, uh, feel like she had a voice. So um, that's one piece. And also something that struck me, Heather, when you spoke around leadership, right? It's not always the healthcare specific interventions that we think about that could make a difference in communities. Perhaps it is the skills that uh, traditionally people might think of as softer skills, but could be the ones that make the most change. Uh, so with that, actually, I'd love uh, Heather, if you can start out the conversation on a bit more about empowerment, how you're empowering those in their own communities. Sure, absolutely. Um, and thanks, Meha. So I thought um, first, let me share a little bit about who Global Health Corps invests in um, in our efforts to drive health equity. Um, and that, you know, I mentioned that we have um, recruited and trained 1,100 Global Health Corps leaders and growing um, to date. So um, this community of leaders, they speak 45 languages and are from 48 countries. Through Global Health Corps, they really work. And to your question, Meha, um, you know, in terms of 
what gaps are they filling in the health system and thinking about the ways that they're showing up as leaders, but they're really filling the gaps in the non-clinical health roles. So they are the architects, they are the data, data analysts, they're information technology gurus, they're journalists, they're supply chain um, folks. They're really filling out that part of the health system that are the non-medical roles. 67% of them identify as women, a majority identify as black, indigenous, and or people of color. Nearly half are African nationals and they join Global Health Corps between the ages of 21 to 30. So we are very generation specific. And that ultimately, you know, we, we believe that, you know, technical knowledge and skills are very important for um, our emerging leaders to hone but equally are important are their leadership and management skills. And so that's why the curricula that we have developed is really grounded in the pillars of authentic and collective leadership along with systems and design thinking. And with that, there's also sort of within those four pillars, really sort of this orientation and focus on developing traits like empathy and resilience and vulnerability. Things that, quite frankly, you know, over my nine years, when I have sat in meetings talking about what does the global health space need, and I would talk about these kinds of traits and qualities that we focus on at Global Health Core, I would often receive blank looks. I would often receive, but we need more epidemiologists. And I would always say, yes, and we need to think about how they're leading and managing their teams, their organizations, their nations. And so at Global Health Core, our leaders go through this curricula and the starting point for them is through our 13 month paid fellowship program. And we at this point are recruiting and training um, talented young professionals to fill these health capacity gaps that are really driven by the health organizations that we work with, whether they are ministries of health or grassroots organizations um, or anywhere in between, even the private sector. And we do this in East and Southern Africa, as well as um, here in the US where I sit. And that ultimately the fellowship provides the global health experience, access to trainings, um, as well as, and very importantly, I would say, a community of like-minded advocates, mentors, and others. And that ultimately sort of 12 years um, since our start, you know, what we're finding and seeing is that the majority of our alumni are staying in the health and social sector. Currently, they are now working at 400 organizations. The majority are collaborating with each other. So we're really seeing the benefits of having this tight knit network and, um, and really seeing them rise into senior level positions. So not only are they staying engaged and connected um, of their own accord, a lot of it is still facilitated by the work that we're doing as an organization to help foster networking and relationship building, still intensive training, partnering with organizations like the African Management Institute or McKinsey, you know, online management training. Because management, I would say, is one of the biggest requests that we have seen from our alumni over the years in terms of the skills that they really see as critical to the success and the work that they're doing, no matter what part of the health sector that they're involved with. So ultimately, you know, obviously we are very dedicated and focused on getting folks early in their career. This is where we think the biggest sort of return on investment throughout um, their lives and their careers to ultimately build health systems uh, um, that are strong, that are resilient, that are informed by people who have the lived experiences from the communities that they live in. And by having this whole sort of other network um, of folks who not only believe in the pursuit of health equity, but are willing to do something about it. So back to you, Meha. Yes, fantastic, Heather. Uh, a, a couple of words struck me when you were um, uh, relaying kind of the journey to where Global Health Corps is today, is even a bit of that sounds like uphill battle when it comes to recognizing the significance of training on empathy, on resilience, right? Um, and what I'm also fascinated by is that not only is it happening on a global scale, but also perhaps Tim, if I can uh, bring you onto this, the virtual stage, empathy and resilience, maybe even in the top-down approach with leaders at our healthcare institutions in the US and how that almost, and I know some from our past conversations is a critical skill to really bridge that, that gap with the community they're trying to serve. So I was wondering, Tim, if you can speak to um, some of the work that you're doing with, with healthcare institutional leadership there. 
Thank you so much. So in so many ways, if you think about it, when um, clinicians have gone through um, their, their educational experience, very little is provided around leadership, servant leadership or empathy. There are excellent um, uh, in, their, in their science, right? They're excellent in their um, research. But that component of leadership is something that either someone falls into <laughs> or if the organization has the system structures and processes in place, we can actually say that this is really critical. It's really critical in terms of being a leader within the context of the organization. And thankfully, I have a CEO who is on board with that thought and really believes that um, the way that we show up demonstrating cultural humility Right. Um, the 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 um, COVID pandemic, if never before, it became quite obvious what we need to do and how we need to do it in terms of the human relationship, because that's exactly what Heather is saying. How do we have meaningful relationships, right, to understand and then to make decisions in partnership? And, and I love that notion of, you know, seldom, I, I think about a new saying that, you know, seldom is it outside you, uh, outside US first. Well, seldom is it patient first <laughs> and then clinician as well, right? I love that, I'm gonna borrow it, right? So the ways in which we think about leadership, the ways that we are saying, okay, leaders um, and clinicians change the power differential. You don't have to lose your expertise to be relational. You can be relational and do it in partnership. We know, for example, that, um, and, and, and the other just quick fact is that um, there are over 600,000 evidence-based research articles on healthcare disparities that exist in the world, but yet we have an increase of healthcare disparities. <laughs> so that tells me that we've looked at it, we've, we've examined it, we've studied it, and there's been no level not fair, very little, <laughs> very little that's been done to really focus in on what are the root causes of those disparities as they occur. Right. Now, granted, the, 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 the patient certainly does play a role in that, but I think we as a healthcare system can be proactive in that partnership. Now that partnership might look different and, and we've, we've been teasing this out um, as a part of literally our formal education, which is meeting, being called in versus convening, that's one piece of it. <laughs> um, and when there's the difference in power, it is, and how do we um, support the community and where the community wants to go while adding the expertise as well. That's a shift in the power differential. It's a different conversation. Um, having those, uh, those conversations that many of us ha uh, have are, are the people who are gonna be impacted sitting at the table when we make these decisions. Because I can guarantee you that there's nuance, there's culture, there's, there, there is um, 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 uh, culture in terms of regional culture, in terms of uh, culture in multiple dimensions, right, as we define it, yeah. that can certainly impact how those um, decisions are made. And then, you know, it becomes the measures. You know, um, we're, we're, one of the things of working in, uh, you know, two, having two academic medical centers as a part of our structure is that we know how to do research. <laughs> so coming up with those measures and coming back to those measures and um, making sure that they're, um, 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 uh, they're, they're, they're looking at the outcomes and then going back and revisiting and looking at the, how we modify and shift so that there is the patient at the center. We're thinking about diversity. We're being inclusive, that equity is at our decision, is a part of our decision-making rubric. All of right. those components come into how we develop people within the system as well. Excellent, excellent. Um, Tim, one of the points that you mentioned, support the community to where it wants to go, right? Uh, that, that struck me a bit. And I'm wondering if, if Kim, we can get on from your lens at, at Planned Parenthood, both as an executive now, but even when you're the CEO of the um, Pennsylvania region and how you identified what local community needs are and how with your leadership roles, you're, you're trying to address them. Yeah, well, I mean, what we think a community needs and what they tell you that they need maybe you know a lot, but I'm going to tell you, you don't know a lot until you listen. 
And um, and then that is why, in, in actually, that that crossover is why I, I came to the national office um, because I felt like the the perspective that I brought was how do we translate the work that we do at the at the national organization into supporting the affiliates um, in our local communities who actually do the work on the ground regionally to make sure that they can navigate issues around race and health equity. I mean, Tim, listening to you, what it, what it kind of makes me think of is putting words into action, right? Because we could read 20 books a month. and But if we don't figure out how to do it, um, then we're never going to move that mark. So, you know, for us, when we look at it through the lens of clinical quality measures that we're trying to address, specifically, we're looking at um, you know, our black patients have the lowest rate of cervical cancer screening among all the racial groups. Uh, Asian Pacific Islander and Hispanic patients who reported tobacco use receive lower rates of counseling than other racial groups. And our self-pay or our uninsured patients um, were provided with lower rates of preventative services like STI screening, vaccines, counseling. They don't have insurance. So staff out of trying to do the right thing, I think, um, are making decisions about what people can afford and therefore sometimes self-selecting and making choices for what the care is for our patients. So, you know, we really, what, what I like to do, what we like to do is to say, what do we have to bring into the local, what capacity do we have to bring our local partners to actually be able to deliver on the healthcare promise? So examples of that include um, making, reducing the gap in the experience that our patients are, are having between white patients and people of color. And so intentional investments in training around implicit bias, Trauma-informed care, this is huge. Um, you know, grounding all of our training and all of our, in, in our service values around respecting and honoring all people. Um, we work with Press Ganey to trade to, uh, I almost said trademark, oh my gosh, to, to benchmark a lot of our work. Um, so in other words, we are doing employee and patient experience surveys. And we measure that progress and it is embedded within our work so that we're holding ourselves accountable. Accountability is a big piece of, of everything we do, which speaks to how we leverage data so that we can actually measure the impact and, and scale our ability to, to reach. And so uh, a tangible example of that is, you know, I told you, we, we serve a lot of patients across the country and yet we are now making a big investment to bring um, our patients into a single shared patient chart. Um, you know, how many health systems have you been in where that experience is choppy as you navigate and you feel like you're starting over every time you see a new doctor? Well, we don't want that for our patients anymore. And so whether, you know, like my daughter had her first visit in a clinic in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and now she's in Portland, Oregon, going to college, you know, the hope there is that her chart will follow her and she doesn't have to remember her history. We can actually, our clinicians are empowered with the information they need, and we can actually measure our health outcomes. Um, when I think about the pandemic, um, we had to leverage our scale to get quick this is not a word, quicker access to PPE when we were really in the crunch um, because individual purchasing power wasn't, wasn't gonna do it. We had to make significant buys. Um, and then we, as a national nonprofit organization, have the ability to, to resource things differently. We can fundraise nationally. We can look and say, where do we need to move resources? Where's the need greatest? And right now, as you can imagine, it is around resourcing um, services so that patients in Texas who can no longer, you know, are struggling to get the access they need can get where they to another state, unfortunately, to get the services they need. Um, and we were able to, uh, you saw the, the jump in telehealth in the pandemic, right? And the use of telehealth. Before the pandemic, only 4% of our services were provided virtually online. 
And within by by April um, of 2020, that was 25 percent. We were able because we could scale it rapidly um, to make sure people got care, and that was really important because as um, legis as uh, legislators and government officials use the pandemic as a political wedge to deem sexual and reprodu reproductive health care as non-essential, telehealth was important. We need to make sure that they weren't limited because they couldn't get it from the nearest health center. So, you know, I could go on and on and on, but I think those that kind of gives you the way that we look at how to empower care on the ground. Yes. Uh, and Kim, your your most recent comments around uh, kind of telehealth and technology and the pandemic serves as a perfect transition, actually, for me, because I was really curious to, to hear both Dale and Anu's perspectives on how really, you know, you both in your own respective uh, uh, worlds see the vision of what you can do to address uh, underserved po patient populations with technology. Uh, would love to hear more about that. Uh, we can start with Dale, hear your perspective. Um, yeah, so our company provides a, a telehealth platform comprised of consumer facing apps and a web browser portal for healthcare professionals. Um, and these professionals are treating uh, black populations dealing with chronic disease and our digital tools, um, through our digital tools, we deliver culturally relatable uh, health literacy, um, evidence-based nutritional instruction, um, and behavioral change to support patients in the 99.99% of their lives that they have to live and manage their disease outside of uh, medical supervision and support. And pre-pandemic, we had in America um, 35 million Americans with uh, diabetes, 100 million with pre-diabetes, between one and three million moving from pre to diabetes each year. Pre-pandemic, we had a shortage of endos, Pre-pandemic, we had a shortage of uh, diabetes specialists. And now post-pandemic, we have um, a greater shortage of healthcare professionals. So technology has to step up and, and fill the gap, um, but not technology just for technology's sake. Um, Alexa is not gonna resonate uh, the same in all communities. So we use technology to extend scale touch, reach, familiarity of local frontline providers um, by providing a baseline of health literacy for their patients. We use technology to relieve some of the health burden um, that healthcare providers could be used in other areas to deliver more value. We, um, so that's how uh, we use technology and that's how we believe that technology can help um, for doctors and health systems. We try to deliver a more ready patient. We believe that uh, an educated patient is a, can translate to a healthier patient and we use the technology to educate that, that patient. So that's how we look at our technology, um, trying to bridge the, uh, the access gap and the equity gap in, in healthcare. Yes, and, and sounds like Dale, through your uh, intervention, you've really put technology in the patient's hands, right? So they can feel more empowered uh, to, to take charge of their health. And I know, I, I believe you have a bit of a different angle, right? Because you're designing something for the community. Uh, so could you speak more to, to your technology? Yeah, I mean, but Dale hit it actually right on the head. It, we, we have a different application, but I think it's the same ethos. Um, to me, access and equity, it, using technology for access and equity is not just about throwing technology at something. You know, it's not just like technology for technology's sake. We often think about access when we design technology as a function of affordability. So just like lower the cost, strip the features and give it to people. And if it's cheap enough, they'll use it. And affordability is only one component of access. And I would argue that it's not even the most important component of access. To me, appropriateness is a far better measure of whether or not something will be adopted and will be long-term valuable to a community. Um, Kim mentioned earlier about listening to the community, 
even if you think you know, even if you're a part of that community, that doesn't mean that you have all of the angles about what is appropriate. And certainly um, being nuanced in how you ask your questions about what is appropriate, what will be useful, and applying a design thinking lens to the sort of the long-term outcomes of things, I think is super, super important. So we we design, I mentioned a cervical cancer tool and not, th not just to talk about cervical cancer tools, but you know, the technology to, to treat precancerous lesions in the cervix exists. And it's not particularly expensive here in the US. Uh, it's just the way that it's been designed, the infrastructure constraints. If you need to buy canisters of CO2 for every 20 patients, you're relying on an external infrastructure and an external supply chain that simply just doesn't exist in most parts of the world. It's expensive where it does, and it, you know, in most places, it's just an availability problem. So by reducing that cost, by taking that cost out of it, we've actually, it's less about the cost and it's more about how many people can get access to this treatment at any given time. And we have the added benefit of reducing cost by doing that. But at, at the same time, we're not sacrificing on the quality of care. We're certainly not just making it cheaper and doing something you know, less good. Uh, we're, we're making sure that we hit those targets, but by looking at it appropriately, we sort of achieve this win-win for the entire healthcare system. And I think there are, you know, as an engineer, I think there are really creative ways to do that. You just need to like, apply the thinking and understand your market, which sometimes just doesn't happen in the med device world. Excellent, thank you, Anu. And, and one of the um, pieces that you mentioned is that designs have to be, or interventions have to be designed based on a lot of external factors as well. Just curious, Anu, uh, from your lens, uh, globally and or locally, are there any policy shifts that have taken place recently that you'd like to speak to that have kind of impacted how you're uh, addressing uh, health issues? Yeah, one of the things that we, I think is super important is to both understand the headwinds that you're up against as well as the tailwinds. We're focusing on cervical cancer. I mean, cryoablation has been done in all parts of the body for, for decades. This is clinically, it's not a new procedure. You can freeze parts of body tissue for lots of different things. We've started in cervical cancer because of these uh, sort of tailwinds behind us in cervical cancer elimination. WHO announced in 2018 that uh, we're going to eliminate cervical cancer in our lifetimes by 2050. And that leads to um, that leads to a lot of momentum on the ground. It leads to momentum on the technology side, on the implementation side, uh, at national health system levels. And that's a that's an example of a positive policy shift that can help you. Uh, move things along. I think with uh, with what's happening even in COVID, you know, I come from an infectious disease background, what's happening in COVID has also shown us um, where actions don't always match up with policy shifts and, and things like that. So I think understanding where you are in that spectrum and figuring out where you as an organization or where you as a leader can plug in to, to help shift the currents is a really important thing to do. We've talked a lot about vaccine equity through COVAX, and I think there is a lot of global commitment, for example, in COVID, um, but it's not translating just quite yet, or it's been, it's been very slow to trickle down to the countries that actually need it. So trying to understand what those, um, what those headwinds look like and, and what that policy climate is that's leading to that slow adoption and slow rollout of vaccine, I think is really important because that's where the opportunity lies, particularly from a technology standpoint. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, great to have that reflection, even on how, uh, uh, with kind of the positive policy shifts, right, with the WHO and, and seeing the folks in cervical cancer. Uh, but speaking of policy shifts, I know, as we said, they're not always um, positive per se. So maybe Kim, we can kind of <laughs> lean into you here from your lens at, at Planned Parenthood regarding sure. policy shifts. Yeah, I mean, boy, there's all kinds of policy shifts. Um, I mean, at, at Planned Parenthood, our our policy approach is really it's grounded in making the connection between health equity and social justice. Right? These that's the intersection for us and leveraging our policy teams both in our national office as well as across the country in our affiliates. 
uh, to advance access to sexual and reproductive health care and information, education too. We have to fight for that too. It's not just for the care. Um, we have to do that because we have to dismantle the stigma around sex, around sex education, around sexuality. Um, and we've really had to stay vigilant on advocating for people's rights to the care. So it's not just our role as a care provider, it's actually ensuring that we're fighting for their right to have it. Um, we are a trusted provider, we are educators, we're advocates, we're researchers, and we understand that a person's health outcome is dependent on a number of factors, including what zip code they live in, their income, their health insurance status, do they have access to transportation, and can they actually get to the health care that we're saying is so accessible, right? So in the US, investing in the social determinants of health and expanding Medicaid coverage are the top two domestic policy agendas for us. Um, and we continue to drive that forward on all fronts because they not only improve patient health outcomes, but they actually help our clinicians across the country provide the care that people need from us. And when we're crafting policies and we're working with legislators on policies, our focus is to think about it um, with a quadruple aim, right? It's around equity, it's around safety, it's around quality and experience of care. Um, I think this group is so well versed in the social determinants care, I don't have to say what the definition is, but I do think it's really important to lift up that actual health care itself only accounts for 20% of that, right? It's the other 80% that if we don't address a person, um, you know, housing and education and public safety and access to healthy food, then we're never going to close the gap in health equity. Um, women of color experience disproportionate structural inequality, discrimination, systemic racism, and that has a severe effect on their healthcare experience. Um, these, it's linked to the disparities in the rates of cancer for women of color, HIV, STDs, STIs, I should say, and mortality during pregnancy and childbirth. On average, thinking about pay equity, which is a big issue for us. You don't think Planned Parenthood and pay equity right away, but one in four women in America come to us for their care. So that's a, that's a key part, right? And when women are making 82 cents on the dollar compared to men, that's a problem. Um, and, and it gets worse. It, it's 53 cents on the dollar when you are looking at um, wages for Latina and Native American and Black women. I mean, it's just, it's bleak. Um, so, you know, we at, at the organization feel like we have an outsized responsibility in this space. And industry leaders, policymakers have to take the steps to understand and direct resources towards specific needs. So, you know, we, you need better coordination and communication between public and private, private sector health. Um, we have to call attention to the inequities in healthcare, but also in education. So, you know, healthcare can't just be my issue. It can't just be Tim's issue. You know, it has to be everybody's issue. We have to all care about wage equity. We, we have to all care about housing and access to food. Um, the Amer uh, President Biden's American Rescue Plan, his discretionary budget includes substantial funding for agencies that can advance health equity, such as $153 million for the CDC Social Determinants of Health programs. There's 48 million in there for the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights. Like, we advocate for these, we advocate for Medicaid coverage, um, because there are still 4 million people who should have access to Medicaid and are currently without insurance coverage. And the lack of Medicaid coverage puts essential care out of reach for more than 800,000 women alone who are of reproductive age. Without it, they don't have access, real access, whether it's affordable or they, you know, whatever, for whatever the reason, to get birth control. They can't get that STI test or treatment and they don't have access to pre and postnatal care. So this is a big issue. It's, a, it's an issue for lots of groups, right? People of color, LGBTQ plus people, not just women. Um, 
and and when you look at it, it's it's about those who have low incomes. We have to help folks have insurance coverage. So you know we fight a lot for Medicaid expansion. Um, the ACA brought that, but we still have states who didn't take it on. They chose not to participate. And so we're very um, glad to see the Build Back Better Act come across because it is focusing on how to further close that gap um, with those states who chose not to go there. And they're doing this through tax credits, they're doing it um, creating individual access for people. So, you know, all of these things are really an important. Um, so, you know, I mean, the House was expected to vote on this bill last week negotiations being what they are between the House and Senate and the White House, it's on, they're ongoing and they're trying to satisfy a lot of the competing priorities, but we remain optimistic and we remain, we stand behind these things no matter how hard they are. Um, and of course, on Monday, we did have a win, gotta, gotta celebrate the wins. Um, we had a clear policy agenda uh, ready for the Biden-Harris administration um, when they when they came in to undo the harm that was caused by the previous administration. And, you know, they understood that putting Planned Parenthood back into federal programs like Title X was critical. We Planned Parenthood provided 41% of the patients with their Title X care across the country. That's, so when we had to exit the program, there was no way for other organizations, and they, and they tried, but they couldn't fill that gap. So we're very excited to have an administration that understands the importance of contraception. So, and of course I do wanna say like, we don't do this alone, right? We feel a lot of responsibility and sometimes we're in front. A lot of times we're standing next to or behind because we, we have to do this work in partnership and, um, and we are not always the right messengers but we are there to support and work in coalition, so stronger together, right? Stronger together, <laughs> stronger together. Uh, from policy shifts to kind of speaking as social determinants of health, I feel that all of us could, could have some more to contribute. Um, before I uh, call on anyone else, uh, feel free audience to put in any questions into the Q&A. We welcome your questions uh, and, and eager to, um, to hear your perspectives as well from the audience. So with that, um, I did actually have, a, you know, going back to the fact that all of us here really have not just a, a U.S. and global, maybe both, right, a lens that, that intersects the whole world. I would love to hear from you, Heather, on maybe the red thread that you see uh, from Global Health Corps in your work between addressing health inequities globally and locally in the U.S. Sure. Thanks, Neha. I mean, I think first and foremost, uh, COVID specifically has showed us that public health is global health and that a virus uh, does not care about borders. Um, it doesn't care about national solutions um, and that, you know, one country's plan to solve a virus is not going to help for a global crisis and that we absolutely need better global collaboration in the future. And I think specifically thinking about the U.S. as part of that globe, um, you know, we're not, as a country not immune to health inequities. And this is why, you know, since our start in 2009, we have focused our work here in the U.S. as much as in other parts in East and Southern Africa, because many people in the U.S. don't even realize or can't even imagine that, you know, the rates of HIV AIDS in some neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. are the same as in some capital cities in Sub-Saharan Africa, that similar to the maternal death rates in some neighborhoods in the Bronx are, are similar. And that, you know, even with all the U.S.'s biomedical prowess and the massive amounts of spending that's happening, that the disparities are so stark in the US. And so you know, if there's gonna be any sort of silver lining that comes of this pandemic, it is really shining a light on who are those that have been able to have access and availability, you know, whether it's been here or abroad um, and what needs to be done and what are, who are the folks that need to be you know, in more of those decision-making roles? What are those solutions and that you know, bi-directional learning and engagement is so important because, you know, in our work at Global Health Corps, 
many of our leaders and partners that we work with in Sub-Saharan Africa have been through pandemics or at least epidemics before with the Ebola crisis or others. And many of our leaders had worked in West Africa during Ebola and actually during um, this past year and a half, some, many, have been working on the front lines in their countries. But we've also had alumni here in the U.S. working um, through the work of Partners in Health and other government agencies to be taking the lessons learned of how do you deal with prevention and response and roll out now of the vaccination um, to what has been used. How is it to engage community health worker programs? And so it's just, I think, one of the most important things we think about that red thread and sort of the recognition of sort of what is local is global is to really appreciate and understand, uh, you know, that the solutions are coming from all parts of the globe um, and that it can't just be driven or thought of, you know, that like the U.S. is going to solve it. So I think, you know, sort of a little bit more humility and appreciation of what other people's countries, regions, experiences have been um, to be able to think about not only how we're you know, addressing it now, but as we think about what really are resilient and um, equitable health systems, that it has to be far more collaborative and it has to be those who are oriented towards equitable health systems that need to be at those decision-making tables. Uh, of um, the phrase that you used, Heather, bi-directional engagement. I think that that really says it all, right? And it's almost a phrase I feel like all of us can use as we as we have you know design solutions, right? Executing solutions uh, for the communities that we're trying to serve. I, I'd actually like to um, uh, uh, actually let me just check in case there there are any uh, questions. Yeah, one question came through. I'll just finish my thought real quick. Um, Tim. You, I feel like you touched on this uh, in, in different ways, right? That concept of bi-directional engagement with hearing the community, hearing patients first, uh, making sure leaders hear their, their voices. Could you speak to any specific uh, initiatives that, that you've helped lead around that to ensure that takes place? Sure, I have to tell you all, as I've been listening, um, I had to mute myself because the connections is like, bing, bing, bing. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the connections are coming through. Um, around what we're saying, because aren't we all saying, if we think about patient community and clinicians, if we think about um, organizations coming together for the sake of patients and having people, uh, having um, community members and patients uh, in that conversation, if we're talking nation states coming together with this, we're talking about the same dynamics at various levels of system. Right. So, so there's a mastery that gets built as we think about um, w whether it's happening in my neighborhood on my street or whether it's happening at the nation state level. We can use those, th th those same attributes to be able to empower, bring people together for empowerment and have that bi-directional, multi-directional right, um, conversation as well. So, so I'm really um, struck by that. So there are multiple ways that we're doing this, right? So one of the ways, of course, is through, was through um, um, uh, certainly the COVID pandemic and how it hit um, Boston and also our surrounding communities and how we came together around that. And that was the bell that rang that people, and, and again, it's not like we didn't know it before, but the tipping point happened with COVID where those relationships are relationships that we realize matter and they need to be involved in what we do because the reality is many people thought that we were doing great with our communities of color. Many people thought that, oh, well, you know, um, we have that department over there that's actually going to deal with it. And now it is, it's actually our collective responsibility, accountability, and our humility that where that matters. So we have that around some of the work that we're doing around uh, diabetes. I think about the work that we're doing um, um, in terms of COVID. I think about the work that we're doing in terms of um, um, weight loss, that because that's also, as you know, um, really important in terms of um, health and well-being. And I, I put in the chat, you know, in realizing that health care happens in a clinical setting, but health happens in the community. So the prompt is leaders, how are you going out and connecting in relationship in the community so that we can be better at what we do? The beauty is that, um, and I often talk about this, is that there are most 
untapped resource is our commitment concern and 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 most of the and the reasons why we're actually working in healthcare is because we care about other people. So let's put that in action. Um, and so those um, those partnerships, those collaborations, those those ways in which we're pulling people um, um, and, and and also dropping them in environments where they don't hold the power. <laughs> right, a new way of thinking, a new way of orienting, and a new way of listening that's going to make a difference as well. So we're, we're being very intentional about that, Miha, thank you. Thank you, and, and we've received a couple of uh, great questions, I think, that build on exactly these themes from the audience. Um, it's, it's a question that I, um, that I feel very excited about because something I feel like all of us think all the time. It's simply, uh, a question around leadership. But before we answer that, actually, I'll, I'll just give all of us a preview. So we have a question around leadership and how we all define leadership. If there's a collective definition we can agree upon. Uh, there's a second question, actually, and I will like to start with this one. Dale, if I can call on you a little bit more as we, um, because I, I feel like we're, we're been macro a bit in the past few minutes, but if we can just get micro for a second and get more into, and I'll um, read it, Specifically with your company, Dale, how could you speak to a bit more on how exactly you help your clients help these patients manage their hypertension and diabetes? So, um, you know, a typical healthcare engagement is you go into a doctor's office, they're glued to some billing software, and uh, 15 to 20 minutes later, they say, eat better, exercise more, see you in three months. And that's no disrespect to doctors, it's how the reimbursement system is gained, where they're incentivized to perform like that for survival. Good for billing, bad for patients. And so the solution has to happen, like we've talked about, um, some people have said 10%, 20% happens with, you know, inside of the clinician's um, four walls. I would even argue as each year goes by, less of a percent happens inside of clinician's walls. More variables that impact health are happening outside of the four walls uh, these days. So our solution is to through mobile, where, which is a, a tool that's becoming, it's already adopted uh, more in black populations and other groups. Um, and that percentage goes up each year. A lot of our patients have um, smartphones and have no access to broadband at home or work. And so through mobile, we provide virtual classes where patients can enroll in a class where the end goal is to learn um, about the disease in question, the impact of the disease on the body, the consequences of an unmanaged disease, and the steps and the practices to take to maybe reverse the progression of the disease uh, to sometimes reducing medications. Um, and we set it up where um, we know that not every person has access to a healthcare provider, so it can be um, do it yourself, but you can also use it in conjunction under the supervision of a provider. Um, but the end goal is to promote um, health accountability, um, to give information um, and the tools so that people can try to um, improve their health on their own. Um, and so, yeah, that's just a little bit. And, and to me, Dale, that's a, a clear, um, uh, a, a clear almost day-to-day -day example in the, in the view that you're taking. And, I, and I can, uh, you can hear me circling back to the third theme of empowerment and perhaps leading to the topic of leadership, that you, what your approach is not to say, this is what you need, um, and this is what you should do. Here are the tools and resources available. Here's a way for you to become more literate perhaps with your health and then, and then take charge of it. Um, when I think about leadership, that's what it is, right? It's about 
being bold to say, these are the problems that I see. I, as a leader, don't have to solve all of them, but I can provide other, others with the tools to do so themselves. I would love to hear from each of you how uh, how you state that. I mean, honestly, that was just top of my head. So perhaps I'll be a little bit, <laughs> I can have an evolved one by the end after I hear five more individuals speak to it. Uh, since Dale, we were just hearing from you, perhaps we can hear from you exactly what how you may define leadership. Um, I look at leadership as a uh, first, I don't think leadership necessarily means you have to be in the front to lead. I think you can lead from behind. Yes. Um, I believe you good leaders have to understand where they are in the value chain, where they are in the fight, um, mm -hmm. what unique assets they possess and what skill sets they bring to the problem, and then having the courage to activate your own intervention, which may initially seem like it's being done in isolation, but really it's in unison with other leaders in their corners of the world who are bringing their skill sets and, and having the courage to activate. I, I, I feel like yeah. it's like a superhero <laughs> squad where we all have something, um, yeah. we all have blind spots that another superhero can, can compensate for. Um, and we could be superheroes individually, but as a team, it, it's much better. So that's how I look at leadership. Dale, superhero squad. And see that, I feel like that second word squad is also key because as you said, it's not just courage to activate your intervention, but doing it with other leaders. And Heather, maybe I'll ask you now because I feel like you also touched on that earlier with your approach with, with Global Health Corps and the leaders that you empower. Yeah, so- How do you define it? Yes. <laughs> as you can imagine, I mean, this is what we do every day at Global Health Corps. So I love this. We could probably have just a panel talking about leadership, but, uh, you know, so I will try to keep it short. Uh, but I think coming off of your question, absolutely, I think it is so essential to be thinking both about the collective leadership approach and how do you work to build that muscle of collaboration, you know, especially if you're working along lines of difference, how do you engage in that, as well as, you know, Tim before mentioned servant leadership. So really thinking sort of about that authentic leadership part, connecting to why you do this work, building your, you know, sort of skills of empathy and humility. So, so we really think of it, as I mentioned, sort of two of our four pillars around sort of the individual and the collective. But then when we also talk about, um, you know, a lot of what Dale says resonate too is, you know, and the question is like the practice of leadership, we actually say, call it like our leadership practices, meaning that there is no point where you're gonna achieve perfection, but that is something that you need to intentionally practice every single day. And when we think about those, we think about the practices around your commitment to social justice and what does that look like, to collaboration, to adapt and innovate. You know, Kim was talking about being flexible earlier. I don't think it was more needed than during this time of the pandemic when all of our job descriptions were thrown out the window. Thinking about also the ability to inspire and mobilize others. Uh, at Global Health yeah. Corps, we say, no matter if you are a research scientist behind a desk for 10 hours a day, or if you are an activist protesting in Washington, DC, all of you have a voice that matters. So how do you connect into that story and how do you use that to be bringing about change? And so, you know, the, being, the importance of self-awareness and commitment to learning, and then ultimately bringing and harnessing all of that to get results, right? Because all of it is towards, you know, how do you think about getting change and I think that that how is so important because it can be so easy to just focus on the goal. And I myself have been very guilty of it, just being task oriented. This is going to be the easiest way to get the answer. My deadlines are due. Like, this is how we're going to do it. Right, right. Compared to the practice of like taking the beat, being thoughtful of how do you include and engage others? Are you having, you know, to Dale's point, where are your blind spots? You know, is why we are intentionally as a community at Global Health Corps bringing together the diverse leaders, not only from their backgrounds and their nationalities and their perspectives. Um, it's not always easy. There's a lot of conversation that needs to happen, but it's where we really think bringing together all those parts of leadership and leadership is not just at the top, but is really right. at all levels. And I think that needs to be, you know, even further recognized um, across all of our spaces, but it is through that um, is where collectively um, that you can be making a much greater difference. Yes. Um, 
And I love you sharing the, the leadership practices as well. I think that that's great to uh, for us all to, to be reminded of and hear again. And also, Heather, you mentioned it really, we simplify, it's not just focusing on a goal. Uh, anu, I know you you kind of have a, a, a something that builds off of that, right? It's not just focusing on a goal. So maybe you can share with us your definition of leadership. Yeah, so we talk, um, the HBR definition is achieving a goal by marshalling human capital. And I think that is kind of the big difference between leadership and what we think of as management. Um, management, you may have all of these other things that you're responsible for. Certainly people is one of the things, but uh, as a leader, it's not about being in a position. It's not about, you know, having a title. It's not about, um, you know, all of the, the day-to-day minutia, but it is like, how do I achieve the goal? And how do I use the people and the human capital around me to achieve that goal? And Dale mentioned that it doesn't just have to be from the front, you can lead from behind. You you sort of keep what the, um, what the perspective and the talents of the people around you are in mind and, and tailor your approach to achieving the goal based on that. So building a little bit off of what Heather said. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I know now Kim and, and Timothy, you both are in um, official leadership roles right within your healthcare institutions. But I think in the, the last few minutes we have left, perhaps we can close out on each of your definitions. So maybe we'll start with Kim. Please, yeah. yeah, I mean, so, so many good things already said. So I don't want to repeat what's been said, but I think an element of being a leader, again, wherever you sit within an organization is creating a vision. That, that people will rally behind, get behind, gives them meaning to their work every day. Uh, being inclusive and in setting the strategy to achieve that, that vision. Um, and I think, I think it was Heather, you said it, that you know, we have to learn from people. We have incredible, incredible folks on our team who have all the smarts, all the expertise. And what we have to do is give them the tools and the decision-making authority to actually deliver on those strategies and make it happen and, you know, get out of the way and let folks get it done. Tim? Yeah, thank you so much. So a couple of things come to mind, one of which is, yes, all of this, right? <laughs> yes, all of these things are leadership. But there's something fundamental that I want to pick up on that, um, that I believe and something that um, I really speak to in terms of leadership is the belief that Others are creative, capable, and competent. And if we believe that others are creative, capable, and competent, then therefore, to uh, Dale's point, we can give people resources. Oh, guess what? And they can manage it. <laughs> I don't need to prescribe because we're all capable, competent, and creative in terms of how we do what we do. And I think that's at the crux. So if I believe all those as a mindset, therefore, when we think about our definition, our organization, which is around inspiring um, our workforce in terms of uh, modeling our values and competencies and embedded in that, of course, are uh, drives equity and include, you know, all those words, but that doesn't matter <laughs> if I don't perceive you to have knowledge, if I don't perceive you to be capable and an expert on your own experience and able to, and it may not be delivered and communicated in the way that I might be accustomed to hearing, but it's still valid, right? All those ways. And also that leadership may show up differently. For heaven's sake, I'm a black man who grew up in Cleveland with parents from the South. So my, if, if my, the way I move through a room <laughs> is not seen as leadership, the way that I am collaborative and communicative and the ways that my hands move when I talk, if that can't be deemed as leadership, then we need to revisit the definition because it needs to show up in a multitude of ways and it exists all around us. It's not just associated with titles. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Yes. Thank you. Creative, capable, and competent. All, all of us as leaders have to have that mindset as well, not just what we do and not just our ability to inspire and mobilize, but really think and, and see potential in others to be leaders as well. Exactly. So, exactly. Great. Um, thank you, panelists. I feel like we had a, a fantastic discussion, very, very inspiring on many levels. Uh, re we reflected a lot about uh, topics related to how we can all address health equity within our healthcare ecosystem. I would love to hand it back to Latha for some final words. All right. Uh, thank you, Meha, uh, for this really fantastic uh, moderation. And um, 
highlighting key aspects uh, because we obviously have a extremely dynamic panel um, with such experience, but such rich insights and backgrounds and uh, uh, ranging, uh, you know, this is so exciting to hear this. And I say this every time that I have the best job on the planet and, and uh, the, <laughs> this opportunity to hold the space uh, for such absolutely energizing and generative conversations is a true privilege and a highlight for me uh, in my time at the new school. And this is really exciting. And uh, so thank you so much panelists for joining us. Uh, this has been absolutely enlightening and the passion and the experience and the insights, I think all of us will uh, take a lot of things away from this. And in fact, I was like, okay, the conversation is going so well. I was telling Meha, like, let's not do too many questions. I don't want to stop the flow. This is an uh, amazing conversation. So thank you, everybody. And then uh, just in terms of the uh, next event uh, for everybody, uh, it's going to be on October 20th, uh, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And when we invite global panelists, we switch the time a little bit uh, to accommodate uh, our global panelists. And this uh, topic is going to be on how do we move from social impact to social justice using technology? Uh, because we've heard a lot about technology uh, in creating impact. And uh, what we want to do in this is, this is going to be featuring some uh, socio-tech entrepreneurs and venture um, owners, but also scholars in the space, and really looking at how do we move from impact to justice? Uh, and, and what does that involve? And so excited to uh, see and welcome all of you back again in that event. And so thank you very much, uh, Meha Hain, for the great facilitation. So thanks everybody for joining us and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.